This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the niche details of modern warfare and underreported conflict with me, Jake Hanrahan. Today we're speaking to journalist Ari Flansreich. He's going to be talking to us about the ongoing tensions between Palestine and Israel. He's going to talk to us about the Palestinian Joint Operations Room and the prospect that a third intifada is coming or some believe that it's actually already started. There's been lots of raids, uh, lots of violence recently in the region and it's not looking good. If you like what we're doing, support us at patreon.com slash popular front. Our new documentary is out now at youtube.com slash popular front. So recently, uh, over the last couple of weeks, over the last couple of months, but particularly the last few weeks, there's been a lot of chaos uh, happening in Palestine between the Palestinians, the Israelis. Specifically, Lion's Den seems to be a big part of this. Also, big situations um, via Gaza. A lot is happening. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe kind of explain to us where did all this recent round of fighting start and what is going on exactly um the most recent round of fighting well there's two questions at stake i think there's a there's a much broader picture which i think is necessary to, in, in order to understand what happened about a week ago um but the more specific picture is this there's a sheikh named Khadr Adnan. um he was an islamic jihad advocate and activist in the west bank he spent i think the better portion of his mid to late adulthood in and out of prison and he was quite famous for hunger strikes um, on the 2nd of May, if I'm not mistaken, after 87-some days, um, he died uh, after the hunger strike. And Islamic Jihad later that night, as is typical, uh, fired, you know, I'd say 27 or 30 symbolic rockets, which is something they have to do. It's not the initiation of a war. Um, it's something they have to do in order to show ordinary Gazans that dead prisoners, prisoners being a huge issue within the Palestinian political scene, particularly out of Gaza, do not go unnoticed. Um, and what happened is that seven days later, the Israelis opened um, Operation Shield and Arrow, um, where they struck over the course of, I think, one or two minutes, they hit three senior raking um, Islamic Jihad members in Gaza. And that opened the latest round of fighting, which is, um, you know, it's one of several that have been taking place over the past um, four, three to four years. And something that we've been noticing here in Israel and also, of course, on the other side is that there's the gap between operations over the last 10 years is rapidly narrowing. And that's a huge, that's a huge problem. You mean, you mean like from like Israeli operations? Yeah. And so in order to properly understand this operation, I think we have to go back almost 10 years to 2014 or maybe even slightly before. So as you know, you know, in 20, in 2005, the Israelis withdrew from Gaza. Um, and they put in the Palestinian Authority. In 2007, after two years of what was already a bit of a struggle for the Palestinian Authority, because Hamas was quite strongly embedded in Gaza, and they refused, they outright rejected the Oslo Accords. In 2007, Hamas comes to power, and in a violent uh, uh, ousting, as it were, they deposed the Palestinian Authority, people were thrown off roofs. Um, and from 2007, basically, through to 2014, Israel refused to let Hamas sleep which was the best thing they could have done for Hamas because Hamas was a resistance group that basically bought, just like Hezbollah in Lebanon, they bought Palestinian, the Palestinian public by way of saying, we're not going to be like Abbas. We're not going to make peace. We're not going to sit down. We're not going to talk. We're not going to give land. We're not going to exchange. We're going to fight. We're going to wage tireless resistance. And from 2007 through to 2014, um, Hamas wages, Hamas basically has to fend off uh, four separate Israeli ground invasions, and that's in addition to you know periodic strikes, targeted assassinations, strikes, buildings, etc. Um, and in 24 and throughout this entire period, Islamic Jihad was relatively quiet. Um, Islamic Jihad was formed in 1981, some six or seven years before Hamas, um, and they were basically they broke off of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they were founded by Gazans who were. Part Egyptian, part Gazan. Some of them were on the border area between Gaza and Egypt. Um, and they didn't cause Hamas much trouble. And so in 2014, that's, the, that's Israel's last ground invasion. Um, and then a big lull comes upon the Gaza Strip. It's completely quiet for the first time in a long time. 
um, and that's not good for Hamas. And around the same time as you know, the Syrian civil war began, I think it was it 2010, 2011, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and what happened was uh, Hamas at that point, two years before the last Israeli invasion, they decided that we are going to shaft Syria and shaft the whole Shia axis. They denounced Syria and they lost Hezbollah and they lost Iran. And I think they wanted to give the more Western leaning countries a try as it were. And the years go by, uh, there's no resistance, there's no prisoner exchanges. Um, it's far too quiet in Gaza and people begin to complain. Um, there's public tirades that are going around the internet. Um, and this kind of come, this boils over, I'd say in 2018, when we begin to notice that Islamic Jihad is, they're, they're launching uh, attacks on Israel without Hamas approval. Um, they were rounded up by Hamas in many cases, um, and they shot at Hamas soldiers. Uh, and then we reach uh, 2019, where we have a little bit of a, a, a scuffle between Islamic Jihad and Israel, uh, which I think very much bothered Hamas because this was the first big event since 2014, and here you had Islamic Jihad more or less, you know, taking the cake. Um, and Hamas began to fear for their own control over the Gaza Strip. You know, the Western-leaning Gulf states weren't helping them much, and they had already been shafted by the rest of the Shia nations in the area. Um, which brings us to 2021, which I think in another, it might even already be known as such, but definitely in, in the future, people will look back and see May 2021 as the turning point in the history the modern history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where um, Hamas, as you know, there, was, there are all sorts of tensions at Al-Aqsa Mosque in May of 2021. And, you know, it had been seven years in, since Hamas had done anything. So I think the Israeli, I think even the Israelis were completely convinced that they could do whatever they want. Um, and there were all sorts of tensions at Al-Aqsa Mosque, and Hamas released a statement saying, if you guys don't leave, Al-Aqsa, and if you don't leave this other neighborhood in Jerusalem called Sheikh Jarrah, which is quite tense, um, then we're going to fire rockets. Of course, the Israelis did nothing. Um, and lo and behold, rockets came pouring down. Thus began, this, this broke the silence of, of just under a decade. Um, and there were three things that happened at that moment. Um, you had internal rioting within Israel which consisted of lynchings. You had you know, mixed Arab Jewish towns that were devolving into complete violence. Many people died. And it, that's probably what was most remembered by, by the Israelis. If you ask the average Israeli, uh, and if you look at all the media coverage of May 2021, if you ask them what happened in May of 2021, their first answer is Arab Israelis were lynching Israelis. Okay. But alongside this, you had Hamas breaking their silence, and even more importantly, you had in the West Bank the first instance, what I believe to be the first instance of shootings, uh, uh, gunfire on Israeli troops in at least five years. And, and so all of these things come together right there. And from 2021 through to the present day, um, everything is more or less unraveling. As you see, you know, you have the Palestinian Authority on the brink of collapse. Um, and you have Hamas and Islamic Jihad. And now, to answer your question, what does this latest operation mean? We have to ask, what, 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 what are the relations between Hamas and Islamic Jihad? And so, as you know, they were, they were vaguely aligned for the better part of the last 10 years, right? They're both factions, they both have a similar ideology, they're both Islamist, and they're both against the existence of the State of Israel, and they reject any political processes. Um, aimed at you know dividing the land or reaching a peaceful agreement. Um, but as I said, in 2018, 2019, 2020, um, after Hamas hadn't done anything for years, Islamic Jihad started gaining a lot of traction. Um, and this is also, this coincides with Iran's development. So you can presume that they were probably getting a little more funding. Um, and what essentially happens is things almost break down between the two. Um, you know, as I said, there were arrests and there were shootings and whatnot until about, I'd say over the last year, year and a half, I'll have to look it up. Um, Hamas began opening up suddenly to Iran, which is a strange development. You know, you saw that they were setting out messages to Syria 
um, trying to sort of win back their favor, which is presumably something Iran told them to do, saying, if you want to get back in the fold, you got to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and shortly after, they begin meeting with Islamic Jihad, and they meet with Hezbollah, they meet with Iran, they meet with uh, uh, Nasrallah in Lebanon. Um, and suddenly, within a few months, Hamas called a big joint exercise, a military exercise. Uh, and lo and behold, Islamic Jihad is there with them. And that marked the sort of the, the, the reestablishment or the rekindling, as it were, of what they call the joint room. Uh, in Arabic. The joint operations room. Exactly, the joint operations room. And that, so in that they had um, Al Qassam, PFLP, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, DFLP, like various different, like Marxist militia, jihadist yeah, militia, yeah. like all of it, right? All the flavors of militantism in, in Gaza, basically. But it's headed by Hamas because, sort of, I think one of the main conditions is that, listen, we're all going to strike together or we, we're all going to coordinate, but ultimately Hamas has their own territory and they care more than anything about maintaining sovereignty and control over the Gaza Strip because without Gaza, they have nothing. Whereas Islamic Jihad is an organization that, you know, for the longest time was based out of Syria um, and they're closely aligned, especially as the last few years with Hezbollah and also with Iran. So even if you kick them out of Palestine, hypothetically, they're still going to thrive as it were um so hamas has to hold down their fort and yeah basically we see that this that this most recent operation uh is the first time the joint room in a long time has really come together uh uh which is why you see you, see, you saw all kinds so in the israeli media when the operation began uh, all the israeli commentators were the, this line kept repeating itself and it was is hamas getting involved or else, so long as Hamas doesn't, so long as Hamas doesn't get involved, we're fine. This is fine. And what people didn't understand is that this latest operation is different. Um, even though from without it looks like it's just like any other operation that took place over the last few years. You know, it's four, five, six, seven days of fighting. You have rockets. You have efforts for a ceasefire. Each side tries to pull or push a little more, and eventually, everything resolves itself, and people go, and everything goes back to normal. Um, and that's in part what happened. But what people don't realize is that this latest operation came after, you know, that joint military exercise between Hamas and, and Islamic Jihad. It came after a long string of meetings over the course of many, many months with Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran and other regional powers. And Islamic Jihad, they were at all of those meetings. And so there's no such thing as saying that right now there is such a thing as Hamas by itself and Islamic Jihad by itself. And, 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 and Islamic Jihad also, they, they went to great lengths not to take explicit credit for what was going on. If you look at most of their announcements, um, at least in Arabic, um, it was all, most, uh, uh, most maneuvers were done in the name of the joint operations room. And it later became clear as well that Hamas was logistically, was providing logistical assistance to um, members or, or operatives of Islamic Jihad. Right, but this didn't all happen because Al-Qassam, Hamas, PIJ got bored. Like, there's, 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 there's two sides to this, obviously. Like, what about the kind of, uh, the what led to all of this? The uh, Israeli part in all of this. On the face of it, people are saying that the death of the Sheikh Adnan is what led to it. Because, you know, on the 2nd of May, he died that night they struck. But if that was the case, I'm, I, I kind of doubt that that was the case. It doesn't really make sense that that would have caused this operation, I think. And because, look, bear in mind that the operation began, if I'm not mistaken, on May the 9th. That's a whole seven days after those 27 some odd rockets flew into Israel. Um, my sense is that, I mean, I, I can't be certain, but my sense is that Israel was trying... I guess the question is, was Israel trying to prove something to Gaza or was Israel trying to prove something to its own citizens? You know, on the one hand, you can say that the, that the recent cozying of Hamas to Iran and therefore of Hamas to Islamic Jihad, that, that this left Israel wanting to send a message to Islamic Jihad by saying, you know, we're going to treat you the same way as Hamas. Um, on the other hand, I'm inclined to think in some way, especially in light of all the political mayhem here in Israel, 
um, that this was also a way of proving to Israelis that the government, especially Netanyahu's government, is still attacking terror. We're still on them. We haven't forgotten about them. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, the, the, the operation was fruitless. Right, and Netanyahu's government, I think, though, has a big part to play in this, considering, I mean, this is like the most openly kind of far-right type government I think Israel has had for a long time. Even the Americans who will bend over backwards for Israel are like, yeah, can you kind of chill out a little bit? <laughs> um, it yeah. does. Do you think it's a case of, um, you know, uh, Netanyahu needs this to retain power or, you know, still look powerful, as it was always said in the past? Or is this something different? Because to me, it just feels like, I don't know, revenge or just like bloodlust. I don't know. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think the fact that we're so confused about the operation is some indication that it was A, not successful, and B, a bit, that it doesn't, it didn't really find its place. You know what I mean? Um, my sense is that this might have been, you know, you could look at it a few different ways. On the one hand, it might have been an indirect message to Iran. Um, but if that's the case, it wasn't a very strong message because all in all, they just assassinated a few people. So if we're looking at this as an internal matter, um, it might have been that Netanyahu had to appease some of his other coalition members who have, look, you have to bear in mind that over the last few months, more or less all of the initiatives, the far right initiatives of his coalition, Ben Gvir and Smotrich, have been, have been slighted or they haven't been executed. Um, they've gotten very little done. Uh, and so this might have been in order to appease them. Uh, and on the other hand, it's definitely a welcome distraction. Uh, this also happened in May of 2021. You know, I might remind you that, that in May of 2021, I think it was just as elections were taking place and they were trying to sort out all these coalitions. And that was when Hamas broke their silence. And what role does Lions Den play in all of this? Uh, I know that they're relatively independent as it were um as much as i was kind of a little bit skeptical of that just because of how uh, the palestinian uh, militias work it does seem that they have quite stuck true to that they seem to be not so interested in he said she said politically just in you know resistance or whatever um but a lot of them have been wiped out now they've been killed by the many many operations in nablus um and other kind of similar groups in Jenin. What's what's going on with that? How, how how are they playing a part in all of this? And are they actually like, I don't know, are they are they kind of engaged with this joint operations room or what? No, they're definitely not, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I th I mean, I thought that was true, but you never know. It's true. You never know. I mean, look. I mean, it's an interesting question because, um, I guess we have to go back to May of 2021. But just as an aside, Hamas tried very very hard to win Lions Den over. And they failed miserably. Um, so in 2021, as I said, as all of this nonsense is happening, you have the rioting inside of Israel. You have bombs coming from Gaza, which is Hamas breaking their long silence. And then you have the first instances of shooting on Israeli troops in the West Bank in many, many years. And what I mean is there, were, there was a period of five or six years before May of 2021 where I would go to the West Bank on a regular basis. I could go into refugee camps and no one would look at me. Not a soul would look at me. And it was, you know, record numbers of, of Palestinian laborers from the West Bank were entering Israel, which means they were making good money. And they were coming back, they were building houses. Ramallah was quiet. Nablus was incredibly quiet um, because most of the resistance factions had been wiped out during the 2002 Battle of Nablus, um, which is meant to put an end to the Second Intifada. And this is as opposed to Janine. For example, Janine in 2002 was completely razed and that left people, that left a vacuum and it left a, a real sense of we need revenge. Um, and so it never ceased to be a hotbed for factions. Um, but to go back to the main point, uh, the first instances of shooting on Israeli troops took place in Janine, which made perfect sense because Janine is known to be a Hamas Islamic Jihad um hotbed or, or or strongholds and and the rockets that were being fired were being fired from gaza by hamas and i think a lot of this was written off both by israel israeli media didn't cover it at all um and whoever did talk about it basically wrote it off as this comes part and part this is part and parcel with hamas um and within a few months the israeli intelligence agencies realized that this is not exactly that because the violence began to spread the Janine faction uh, grew and announced itself and then suddenly a bunch of other factions started sprouting and within a year you have lion's den 
Um, but Lion's Den, Lion's Den is a bit strange. You know, they're all locals. They're all more or less market dwellers from the old city of Nablus. On average, they're in their mid twenties. Um, they don't have a strict hierarchy. Um, and Hamas and, and the Palestinian Authority did their utmost to pull them over to their sides. What does that mean? Whenever Lion's Den commits an attack, Hamas would release some sort of statement, either praising them or trying to take, you know, associative credit. Um, and what Fatah would do, or Abbas's Palestinian Authority, is they would call strikes. Um, and they would send representatives to visit the funerals of, of dead Lions Den members, hoping that you know one thing or another would give, and we'd get them on our side. And Abbas obviously assumed that they would be on his side because Nablus is a PA stronghold. It's always been a PA stronghold, and it's the main base of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades, which are the militant wing of Fatah, which is basically Abbas's party. Um, um, and Lines then refused to align with either of them. And the first indication of this was you would see um, the martyr funerals. You know that generally if there's a martyr, they rush them through the streets on a stretcher and they have a head. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, you know, open casket. Type. Open, yeah, exactly. Um, and what you start noticing is that you have martyrs who are being, you know, rushed down the street and they have three headbands on. Or they have two headbands on. You know, one will have an Islamic Jihad one, and right above it, you'll have a Lion's Den headband. And people began saying, like, whoa, whoa, whoa what's, what, what's happening here? That makes absolutely no sense. Because these factions, look, for the better portion of the last 20 years, these factions were always aligned or associated with some broader or bigger political body or a body that would promise some sort of big end. Uh, and here, Lion's Den was saying, we're going to do the exact opposite of that. Um, and so when I interviewed, I recently interviewed um, a guy who sells weapons to Lion's Den. Uh, and he told me that, look, basically, he says, I'm Fatah. I was born Fatah. He says, I drink the milk of Fatah. I drank it from my mother's breast. Uh, but I don't like Abbas. And so I go to Lion's Den. And he says, listen, if they tell me, for example, in Alexa Martyrs Brigades that I can't shoot at Jews, then I go to Lion's Den. And he says that's because it's a completely non-hierarchical sort of collection of lone wolves, which I'm not entirely sure that it's completely non-hierarchical, but it's definitely scattered and they definitely refuse any kind of political alignment. It's very interesting that they have managed to keep that going as long as they have. And I'll be honest, I found Lions Den extremely interesting in that when they started, they said that's what they were going to do. But I guess my cynicism, which in my opinion is kind of quite well placed considering history, um, I kind of was cynical. I thought, well, give it like six months. There's going to be another group is going to take over. Like they're going to just basically become a kind of proxy for whatever. Um, but I was talking to a, a Palestinian reporter um, recently. He's got good access there. And he was saying to me like, look, when you see all these other factions claiming them, kind of what you've just said, he was like, they're not them. He was like, they're lions then first. You know what I'm saying? So it's very interesting that they have managed to stick to that. Um, and that, that, from what I understand, is making them very popular still, right? Yeah, I mean, look, you have to look at the name itself. Uh, where does the name Lion's Den come from? And the name Lion's Den comes from, I mean, on the one hand, lion, lions usually operate by themselves, or at least that's what the guy was speaking to tells me. Well, they're, they're so he says lions. every lion to himself and his freedom. And that's how he explains the lion's part. But the den... The den, it sounds like it's a merely metaphorical. It's a little bit of aesthetic flourish, but it's not that. If you go into the Eliasmina quarter, which is, you know, at the very, very, tucked into the very back end of the old city of Nablus, what you'll notice is that it's basically a collection of caves, old Byzantine tunnels. And so you really, some, some, as, some as wide as the, as the average human waist. And so what you begin to notice that, you know, every line is for himself. And also these lines are operating primarily out of this network of tunnels, this dense, thick network of, of dens. Um, and so they are completely local. And I think they had a pretty good tactic, which is, I think, I don't know if it was a conscious decision, but at some point or another, they decided that we are going to limit ourselves to Nablus. And all of their attacks, mind you, are usually in the immediate vicinity. They're on checkpoints that are on the outskirts of Nablus or on the settlements that are on the hills overlooking Nablus. You know what I mean? And um, 
and 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 when you go to Nablus itself, you start to realize how they've. So there's a few things that have changed in Nablus. First of all, all of the martyr photos that were once Alexa martyr brigades are now lines den. And what was one year ago a single lines den flag, as you reach the end of the old city, entering the Elias Mina quarter, now the entire stretch of the market is filled with lines den. Um, and what's more, they've become a kind of vigilante group. Essentially, they've become a veritable vigilante group. They are they walk around the they walk around the city. If they see someone who's foreign, they'll ask for your ID. If they don't like the look of you, they'll tell you to get out or they'll search your, they'll search your bag. Um, and this all culminated about two months ago in an actual execution. They executed someone in the middle of the city. They execute one of their own, right? Uh, he was. I believe, yeah, he was kind of, I don't know if he was a militant operative, but he was certainly associated with them. Yeah, and apparently he w he'd given up some information to, to Israel from what I read. Um, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty serious, actually. His name is uh, Zohair Ghalid, and he's from the old city. He's from that same Elias Mina corridor. Um, and it, in, in whatever which way, they realized that he had given up the locations of some of the main commanders who were assassinated. Um, it was this Israeli operation when they came in a white truck into the uh, the old city and it turns out that Khalid at the time was actually in that truck with the troops uh, and they got him the way they get many people um, they outed him with uh, a video showing or proving him to be a homosexual uh, they called him up and they said come to our base just outside of Nablus uh, and they gave him instructions but the most interesting thing is that after they had a video confession, they got him uh, on video confessing, they shot him, they left a sign over the pool of blood that was left in his place, saying that this is going to happen to anyone like him. They released videos of them dumping his body in an unmarked grave with an excavator. Uh, and then at the end of it, they, they hacked into his Facebook account and they released a chat that he was having with a either a lieutenant or a colonel, but a senior figure in the Palestinian Authority, who at the same time that the Israelis were trying to manipulate him, the Palestinian Authority was also trying to manipulate him, calling the lines den Hamas dogs. And yeah, it's a crazy, crazy story. Um, and apparently the guy who actually introduced him um, either to the, uh, to the lines den or else who, who helped get him caught um, was actually a local Nablus from the Balata refugee camp who ran into Israel apparently that's the rumor that he escaped to Israel and is shacked up with a Jewish woman wow that's a real yeah. soap opera of a madness yeah it, it's it's pretty it's pretty wild and that's where it leaves us now so what's the um kind of general idea right now over there from what we see from over here it's a rocket has been fired here it's a rocket has been fired there but when i talk to people there it seems a lot more serious this doesn't just seem like more of the same yeah well the whole region right now is absolutely on fire Nothing is normal. And as I said, 2021 is, is that's the name. Um, in 2021, everything completely breaks down. And so if we're talking about the West Bank, as you know, obviously, all of these developments with the factions, they, they put the Palestinian Authority in a very difficult place. Uh, on the one hand, their relations with Israel over the last you know, 10 or so years have been abysmal. I think in large part because the Israelis thought that Abbas and the Palestinian Authority, they're, they're good dogs. They sit when we tell them to sit. And, and so the Israelis, I don't think, felt any need to really strengthen a relationship with the PA. And thus the PA grew weak. And when it finally came time, when the factions woke up, they weren't ready. Uh, and on the Gazan front, you have a, a, a much bigger problem, which is that seven or, or the seven or so period from 20, 2014 through to 2021, that period of quiet was very dangerous, as I said, to Hamas. Um, you had people in the strip starting to spread rumors. You had Islamic Jihad was, was threatening their stranglehold, I guess, over the Gaza Strip. And at one point or another, I think Hamas realized that we have to jump on the Iranian gravy train. Everyone's doing it. And this is the time. And if we miss our chance, we might find ourselves in a very bad place. Um, and so anything that is happening in Gaza is now related to Iran. Anything that's happening with Hamas is now directly connected to a whole sort of chain of command that, that spans from the top rungs of the Revolutionary Guards through Hezbollah to Hamas and obviously alongside uh, Islamic Jihad. Right, but when you say it's connected, how much is actually connected versus 
the Israeli government's justification for kind of, you know, fighting everyone? I don't think it has anything to do with the Israelis. Uh, and the, the Israelis, ironically, it's quite the opposite. The Israelis are trying to downplay the Iranian threat. Because if the average, if the average Israeli citizen understood the, the extent of the mess that is coming their way, the Israeli government would have a very difficult time. And people would be saying that, you know, what's five, six days in Gaza? What are you doing? What, what do you even want from Gaza? And this brings us to another point. If you look at over the last six to eight months, Hamas is, is on a daily basis almost. They're in meetings, and these are photographed meetings with Islamic Jihad, with Hezbollah. They were invited for the first time in 10 years to meet the Iranian president. They were invited for the first time in 10 years also to, uh, to meet uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria. They recently started meeting with Saudi Arabia. And this comes as Iran is also doing the exact same. And it's not a coincidence. People, I think, are realizing that Iran, whether we like it or not, Iran now runs a good portion of the Middle East. They have full control of Syria. They're waiting for Iraq to get on their knees. And they have control of Lebanon. Le Lebanon doesn't even have a president. They can't, they can't elect a president. Yeah, but at the same time, though, they've had like people running riot in the country for like the last year. You know what I mean? In Lebanon? Uh, no, in Iran, sorry. In Iran. Uh, yeah, but those protests, I mean, they didn't, they didn't bear much fruit. Mm, yeah, that is true. They didn't bear much fruit because they weren't armed. Unless you're going to get a bunch of guns in there, the chances of you even posing the slightest threat to Iran. That's actually sad but true. Yeah, um, unfortunate. But yeah, that kind of is. Yeah, it kind of is how it is. You know, it's whoever has the executive force pretty much. Um, well, if you're talking about literally guns versus not even having them, yeah. Um, what's the kind of makeup of the Joint Operations Room in Palestine? How do they actually operate? How often are they, you know, like meeting? Like, what's it actually like? I mean, I know it's called the Joint Operations Room, but I imagine they don't just have one room, you know? It's a pretty sexy name. It is, yeah. <laughs> you kind of picture them in a room with a bunch of screens. I think some of their propaganda videos also include like a room with screens, like a classic CIA uh, situation room, as it were. Um, look, I'm not, I'm not inside any of those organizations, so I don't know exactly how it looks. Um, but I think it's largely... It, I think it largely depends upon the extent to which groups are willing to coordinate. So obviously they have open lines of communication. Um, and most importantly, importantly, they have shared infrastructure, which is, I think, you know, often you hear Israel saying Hamas is not involved. Uh, but, but, you know, to what extent do we really know whether or not Hamas is involved? Meaning you have a total network that snakes under a good portion of the Gaza Strip, which technically belongs to Hamas. Uh, and so that was left untouched. But, but you know, who's to say that Islamic Jihad doesn't use that tunnel network? Um, and who's to say that Islamic Jihad is not being given rockets or that they're not being given, you know, coordinates or positions or intelligence? Um, and so the Joint Operations Room is, is simply, it's kind of a word for we're together and we're communicating and we're coordinating. How does that work in practice? Because... Of course, I understand war. There's always very weird and strange and awkward and like uncomfortable alliances politically. Um, how are they dealing with that? Do you know anything about that? Because to have like PFLP hanging out with Palestinian Islamic Jihad, I imagine it's not that easy going. Well, the PFLP, as far as I know, relative Islamic Jihad and Hamas are, are quite negligible they don't have a map they don't have any serious sovereignty or control over the gaza strip uh yeah yeah and so what you're really talking about is is, is hamas and islamic jihad the rest of the factions are either going to tag along and they're going or they're going to be bench warmers those are their two options but they're certainly not going to be telling hamas and islamic jihad what to do um as far as hamas and islamic jihad my sense is that we're talking about very high level considerations that as i said are coming from a number of different areas but hezbollah and and iran are certainly involved uh, you're talking about high level talks leading up to uh this brief little scuffle were tens of meetings and these were only the ones that were photographed you could imagine that there were far more community there's far more communication between all of these sides but these are there are tens of meetings between high level figures from all of these four parties iran hezbollah islamic jihad and hamas um and so my sense is that a lot of this was laid out in advance and what was left to do was to manage the situation meaning 
Hamas has has they still have a good amount to lose because they are the rulers of the strip. They're responsible. You know, we we, we sometimes forget that Hamas is also a a civil body, right? They have factories and there's 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 pipelines and there's water and there's resources and they have they have jails and police. They have to manage traffic, uh, electricity, uh, and so Hamas has to make sure or mitigate the damage. They can't come out of this operation uh, belly up. And I think that was a lot of the communication. It's to what extent are we going to let Islamic Jihad run wild? When do we have to call it quits? And what about um, the raids that have been ongoing? Um... In the West Bank? Yeah, in the, yeah, exactly. What about that? Um, as of late, things have been relatively, I wouldn't say super quiet, but there hasn't been any... The, the raids that took place several months back where you had the one in Nablus, which was, I think it left something like a hundred wounded and maybe 30, I forget how many died. I think 10 to 13 died and he had some a hundred wounded. And in Janine, you also had quite a dramatic one. And those were both cases in which the Israelis were using explosive devices and, you know, plainly densely packed residential neighborhoods. Um, the last few raids have not been like that. Um, the raids have continued and, and the Israelis, the IDF is operating, you know, day in day out night in night out they're arresting people every single night and they're still raising the homes of any people who were convicted um or suspected of committing uh terrorist attacks uh but the west bank has been relatively quiet uh which is a bit it's a bit curious um but they've been quite quiet as of late what's what's the israeli um reaction to this from what from what i've seen it just i don't know there's there's like videos of like israeli troops just like fucking kicking people's heads in and everyone's like, yeah, don't be a terrorist then. It's like, it just seems very, I mean, I know it's always been extremely divided, but it does feel like with the with the heightened tension, with the heightened violence, it's getting much, much worse. I guess that's kind of obvious, but I don't know. That's what it looks like from the outside. Certainly. Look, as I said, you had, you had many years of relative quiet and the Israelis were able to walk around. They were able to enter villages. You know, I'm talking one or two cars, Jeeps could enter a full town, if not a city, and no one would do anything except for, you know, the occasional stone. And that all changed in 2021. And as of late, you have people are on edge in the West Bank. You know, you have um, people throwing stones at Israeli cars on a nightly basis. You have shooting attacks at least every two or three nights. And the Israelis are operating all the time. They're arresting and they're shutting down villages. And this has a lot of, there are other effects here, consequences that I think are usually overlooked. Um, so for as of late, you see... Um, on Telegram, people uploading videos of traffic jams all across the West Bank. Uh, and people underestimate that they, they, this is beginning to trickle into sort of the civilian realm. And people are getting frustrated. And it, and it raises the level of tension, the stress, and the anger, and the resentment. Um, as far as the Israelis are concerned, I think, I think the Israelis don't really understand what's going on. And I, and, and I mean that on, uh, you know, from the average civilian hanging around Tel Aviv through to the soldier who's actually, you know, coming in under the Jeep uh, in the West Bank. I don't think people have any clue. And I think the Israeli media has reached sort of like unprecedented heights of, of, of just, they're just lying. They're plainly lying to their population. And, and by the way, if you turn on Hebrew media, they don't mention anything in the West Bank unless a Jew is killed. Nothing's mentioned. Um, or if at best they're going to tell you that, you know, the IDF last night raided this or that town, arrested X many men, uh, and it's been handled. Um, but there's no sense of a bigger picture. And that's a huge problem for the Israelis. Because, well, it brings us to another interesting point, which is how important is your civilian population when you're waging war? And an interesting statistic is that uh, during this last operation, so you have something called the Gazan Envelope, and that's a collection of Israeli towns that, that are basically within a few kilometers of the Gaza Strip, and they surround the Strip. And the Israelis have been known to, to do this you know, ever since, you know, I guess, 1948. Uh, wherever you have a border or a sensitive area, you, you surround that area with settlements, and you create a human barrier. Um, and out of some 70,000 residents across the Gazan envelope, people estimate that as many, at least 12,000 and as many as 40,000 residents fled 
And that's after only four or five days of fighting. And you have to ask, and most of them are fleeing, of course, to Tel Aviv, or they flee to villas in the north. And you have to ask, you know, these people are people who came, and I think the deal was, hey, this is a bit of a sensitive area. It's beautiful, and it's quite pastoral. You're going to have a nice piece of property, tight-knit communities. It's quiet most of the time. And every five years, you're going to have to withstand a week of rockets. And suddenly, I think these residents are realizing this isn't every five years. This is becoming every few years or every few months even. And the threats are, are coming almost on a monthly basis. You might have an operation every few months or every year, but every month or so, you have at least a day or two where people are asking, are the rockets going to fall? And the other question is, is, is obviously when this becomes a multi-front war. And we've seen signs of that as of late. You know, we had a brief night where rockets came from Syria, Lebanon, and Gaza. Where are people going to run? And how ready, uh, how, how prepared are Israeli civilians, both menta mentally and physically, for what might turn out to be you know, a very deadly and an extended period of war? the likes of which haven't been seen since 1973, I guess, or 1980. I mean, and, and the Palestinian civilians, because they're going to get absolutely trounced. Yes, that's true. They likely will. Um, I've seen these joint operation rooms and also lines, then people talking about, you know, the next intifada is coming. We've heard that every couple of years. But now it does seem to be like, actually, maybe. What do you think? There are those who say we're already in it. Right, right. Yeah, the way things happen these days, like actually, that makes sense. Yeah, you know, I, it's 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 it's. I think it's smart that you say these days because I think people, if we continue to expect that the third intifada will replicate the second, the way the second replicated the first, I think we're we're a bit wrong. You know, I think things just happen differently nowadays. They do. We we sleepwalk into disaster. At a rapid pace ironically it's very strange the way things are now it's almost like nothing fully starts and nothing fully ends and so therefore no one really has to ever be held accountable it's very strange i, can't, I don't know what the word for it is i'm sure like i think you said it perfectly yeah i don't know but it's it's odd man it's very odd i it, I, I was wondering this because i was looking at it's it like well is this the start and it's like well yeah like you just said well then maybe yeah <laughs> maybe that is the start it doesn't have to start off with a bang like right go it's like well it started off with multiple you know operations and killings and new groups forming and excessive force and you know journalists being shot dead by you know idf uh, uh like shireen you know god rest her soul and stuff like that and it's, it's like yeah is that is that like yeah maybe now it has started i don't know um do, do, do other people share that though or is that just us maybe looking at it a bit too i can tell you that so th there's there's a there's two main Israeli Hebrew language analysts on Telegram. Um, one's called Abu Ali Express and one's called Abu Saleh. They're both sort of obviously... Abu Ali Express, that's very... Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he got, he's got like 120,000 followers. And there's another guy, Abu Saleh, who has now 40,000 followers. He's kind of a quacky, messianic Jew. Um, but both of them worked as intelligence analysts for the, uh, for obviously for the IDF and Abu Ali Express. It's rumored that he still does consulting work for them. And these are people who are fluent in, in, in Arabic, also uh, Farsi, if I'm not mistaken, and definitely Hebrew, of course. And they scan <coughs> um, all of the Arabic language telegram channels and they do this day in and day out and they report on every single thing. And so they have, they have transcribed records of, of all the developments over the last five to eight years. And both of them are regularly commenting, and they commented this also in, in May of 2021, that this third intifada is beginning and it's now. And you shouldn't wait for, as you say, the Big Bang. Um, because what might happen is... My sense is that the West Bank is, is, is something that's going to continue sort of ebbing and flowing. There's going to be a raid, there might be a lot of violence, and then it might be quiet again. Because the West Bank is also very different from Gaza. These are people, this is a population that is living, they're, they're intermingling with Israelis all the time. You have a large percent of the population that is working in Israel every day that speaks Hebrew. And the Israeli to them is also not foreign and alien as it is to the Gazan. And so it's something that I think can simmer and build and ebb and flow to a much, at least in a, in a much different way than it could, for example, in Gaza. Yeah, yeah. Um 
I guess the difference will be that if there is the third intifada, um, then it would mean that more, uh, like more, more your average person who's not actually involved in like clashes, like might end up involved. If you know what I mean, I guess, I guess right now it's, but then again, like your average, there were, there were people joining lines then that previously weren't militant. Right. So I don't know. Well, um, I mean, even the guy I mentioned that, that weapons dealer who I interviewed, he sent me a martyr letter a week ago. Um, this is a guy I interviewed. He's in his 40s. He was in the Alexa Martyr Brigades. Uh, he was shot multiple times, and he was tasked with smuggling weapons back and forth between various areas of the West Bank. And when I met him, his son was in the corner, you know, putting groceries into a bag. And he showed me a picture of his son, you know, covered head to toe in lines and paraphernalia with an M16, which is basically half the size of the 14-year-old, pudgy-faced, cute, adorable, adorable, sweet kid. Um, and he looks at me and he whispers, kind of leans in, and he goes... I don't want this to happen to my son. And then he messages me a week ago. He messages me a picture of explosives. And you can see in the top right corner, there's also like a grandmotherly uh, plate of muffins um, and, a, and a bowl full of ammo. And he, says, and he sends me a martyr letter. And it begins with, forgive me. And it's addressed to his family. And I told him, I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm going back to the resistance. And I said, what about your son? He goes, I'm proud of him. I want him to come with me. And and so you even see it lines then that the force is so wild, the grip on the population is so intense that it's it's even causing former resi retired resistance fighters who are usually very quick to pass the torch on, because most of them you know they spend time in Israeli jails or they lost a bunch of friends, and they just don't have it in them to to go through that again, and even they are going back. Um, but you have your other question, I think you're asking though, the possibility of just like, like, I think it kind of, you're implying chaos in a way. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you see, uh, if you look at even footage of the, the previous two intifadas, it was, it wasn't just armed groups. It was everyone in the stone. You know what I'm saying? Which is how it happens, how an uprising happens. That's what happens in, that's what happens in, in every raid essentially as well what you see is you know the, they'll go in there will be a gunfight and i think people while the gunfights are going on people will kind of keep their distance and the moment the soldiers are you know folding things up they'll start attacking with stones um but i think yeah i think by and large if the conditions are right and if people it's it's all it always depends upon the extent to which people think this will actually harm the occupation and if people get the sense that if we all get into the streets now this will do something everyone will go into the streets that that is actually a very good point yeah people uh you know are not stupid particularly palestinians you know i've been there seem considering everything that's going on there seem a very intelligent people and no one is just gonna yeah it's like it, okay do we kick off now well if the wave isn't coming you don't join it you know what i'm saying but it does feel like it's coming it does feel like it's coming you know from a for, in, in some way and you'll have you'll have a flash of it here and there so um there was an instance i think it was right after the last raid i can't recall exactly when but the lines then they had called for you know night long riots and marches multiple times and no one answered their calls and then after that big raid they finally said everyone get out and to their surprise, I think they were even pretty shocked by it. Everyone from Bethlehem to Jericho to Nablus to Janine, to Al-Karim, Kalkilia, everyone was out in the streets, up, I think through to four or five in the morning. And, and they called it the call of the den. People answered, but it's only because there was enough momentum right beforehand. How much is that lion's den's influence versus people absolutely at the end of their tether after seeing you know brutality via the idf though i think it i it's a mix but i think i, I think it leans slightly more in favor of the lion's den because uh, idf brutality if you watch palestinian telegram channels you see that brutality on a daily basis people are getting killed on average you have one dead a day on average um as this is my this is my instinct i'm pretty sure it's about one a day at least one every two days you see someone dead and most of these people look you know most of them are involved to some degree in one way or another with resistance it's rare that you have someone dead unless it's a civilian during a raid it's rare that you have someone who was targeted and killed and you won't find a picture of them holding a weapon on facebook um but also, you know, kids photographing with weapons and wanting to walk around shooting things is like, it's quite normal.
it doesn't make you into a serial it doesn't yeah i know yeah the, the middle east yeah the middle east is a wild place a lot of people who judge that on oh look at this then i'm like yeah i mean if i grew up there i certainly would have them pictures i was that kind of kid not to ex not to say like um oh these guys weren't militants that's something i really hate you know some people say oh why have you said they're a militant i'm like because they were it's a war they were proud of it they fought they resisted there's nothing wrong with saying the facts whether you like it or not but sometimes it is like you said it's like yeah there's just some random pitch of a kid fucking around you know what i mean well yeah i mean there's two things first of all the jews were also they they were also a resistance group they bombed and they bombed british buildings they bombed a, a british hotel um they were also involved in resistance activities and they were also smuggling people and weapons into Israel for years on end in order to prepare for 1948. Uh, so it's very reasonable. I don't know what people expect them to do. Um, and you also, in the Israeli media, it's always strange. The word they use in Hebrew, it's, it's bakhir. And what it means is senior. And it, it happens almost every time they do a raid or every time someone's shot, they call them a senior member. A senior member, and the Israelis look at it and they say, "Okay, okay, we're 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 gradually whittling away at this big organization's leadership." And they don't realize that there is no big organization. There's barely any leadership, and there's no seniors. These are these are just people with weapons, and you you you, you walk into their town, and they're going to defend their street or their home. It's the same with Turkey. Every time uh, they kill some like pkk fighter or whatever like senior top pkk commander neutralized and it's like man how many decades more <laughs> will it take to neutralize all the seniors if that was true you know what i mean i think it's just a a morale boost for their own side i think well you well you have that rhetoric also after the last which is this is the confusing thing about targeted assassinations right so the israelis Look, they have amazing intelligence capabilities, and you also have to bear in mind that none of this would have happened. You have to also ask yourself, how how do they manage to strike this many commanders? How do they know where all of them were? They, they took a load out recently, right? Uh, well, yes, it also, but in the last, in what happened a week ago in, in Shield and Arrow, uh, they opened it with three dead, and they went on to kill, I think, another 10, 13 all in all. And you have to ask why... How do they manage that? How do they know where they are? And there's two things. First of all, idiocy. Uh, apparently, they were walking around with cell phones, despite the fact that they were told not to carry them. And B, it's spies. Spies, spies is such a big problem in those places, right? Like every single group, every resistance movement, it seems to always be, it pulls people undone quite quickly. And and I not, not to, I mean, you know, whatever snitches get stitches or whatever but but you can understand that people are living like fucking shit like i can understand how people can get quite easily brought in or blackmail or whatever like it, it's not it's not completely insane that it happens. yeah you have the perfect combination of poverty so they need money and a, a traditional society meaning your reputation and humiliation those are very important and so you either get them with the money you get them with the blackmail you get them with both um, but going back to what we were saying before, it's funny because the Israelis, they always need to get senior leaders. Uh, and as I said, the Israeli population, they're very receptive to the notion of high ranking uh, members of any group being assassinated. And it sounds incredibly significant. But by and large, what the Israelis achieved was nothing. They, they gained nothing as far as deterrence. Uh, those senior ranking members, they, they, we were told on Israeli media um, that these were people who coordinated rocket launching groups. And you have to ask yourself the simple question, if someone's commanding rocket launcher, like, what are you doing? You have a rocket launcher, you have guys, you tell them where to go and when to fold, and, and that's it. Like these are very, these are highly replaceable people. And Islamic Jihad just released a statement, I think, 13 hours ago, saying they were all replaced. They've all been replaced. And there's word that they were replaced with people from Syria who will sort of from afar command them. Uh, but the point is they were all replaced and nothing was, nothing was gained. And Hamas, despite the fact that they took some heat for not getting involved, I think there were Gazans and also a lot of forces from without trying to push a narrative of why is Hamas just letting Islamic Jihad take the hit? Um, but I, I would look at it the other way around which is Hamas has far better infrastructure, far greater weapon supplies, um, and a lot more to lose. And they are saving themselves, I think, for, as you say, the one. They're saving themselves for something better, for something bigger. Um, 
and I think we have all the indications that that is coming because uh, you know we had that multi-front attack where there was threats that Hamas or Hamas did fire rockets from southern Lebanon, and this is just a week after I think uh, Hezbollah gave them permission to operate freely in southern Lebanon. That's a crazy event. Hezbollah giving Hamas permission to do whatever they want, really, for the Palestinian people out of Hezbollah's southern Lebanon, uh, southern Lebanese territory. Um, so it looks like uh, we're this is part of a, a much bigger picture. And unfortunately, the Israelis are doing whatever they can, at least from within, to have people look at or interpret these events as discrete. One operation after another. These were the aims. This is what we achieved. Is there much, um, well, how, how much back and forth interaction, uh, cooperation is there between like Gaza and the occupied territories when it, it comes to all of this? I know that, you know, Hamas is, has been on the rise quite a lot in, uh, in like the West Bank, uh, Jerusalem, um, I guess that's ramped up. I don't know. Like, has it? Um, has it ramped up? Lately, no. Hamas did their best. Well, to answer your first question, um, my sense is that the connections between the two are loose. And, and, and that's to say that Hamas, of course, I think they, well, it's both. One, is, one has a lot to do with propaganda um, and, and incitement. That's the big tool. And obviously, I think they have militant cells. I think they're relatively limited, but they have militant cells with whom they're in you know, contact and they advise them on how to prepare for things. But I think, if, I think if Hamas really had serious sleeper cells in the West Bank, we would have been seeing bigger attacks by now. You know, Back in the day, Hamas was pulling off suicide bombings on a near daily basis, 60 people dead in one bus. Almost every day, people stopped sending their kids to school. People stopped going to work. And that was also the reason for the wall, um, is because it just became unbearable. Hamas was so successful at that time. Um, and so during Ramadan, what my sense was is that Hamas was doing all they could um, to get people in Jerusalem to act up in order to uh, uh, get the Israelis to provoke, in which case they'd be able to respond perhaps minimally in order to gain some credit but it's all i a lot of it's a lot of it's happening from a distance um but one thing that's interesting to note is that is two things first of all the pa is working day and night to root out any hamas elements in the west bank um and you had an interesting development a few weeks ago there was word in ramallah of a um carpenter's workshop that's been known it's i think it's known to be run or owned by a family that's hamas related or affiliated um and they've also in the past discovered tunnels under this house and a massive explosion took place and the pa went and rounded up a ton of people they got right on that and over the last week the main university in nablus university politics Palestinians have weird politics um, and sectors of politics. You have obviously factions, you have proper you know, government politics, and then you have prisoner politics, and you have school politics, which are strangely very important to the Palestinians. Um, and An Najah University in Nablus, the, the Islamic bloc actually won. They beat Fatah last week, and it was such a big event that Fatah later, um, or various operatives and the PA security forces came uh, with weapons, and they were shooting in the streets uh, and scaring people, and I'm pretty sure there were injuries, and word has it that within the next week, the uh, Berzet University, which is closer to Ramallah, might also fall into Hamas hands, uh, which is an interesting development, and it's been overlooked by and large. Is there any chance of like de-escalation here, or is it just too late? Uh, de-escalation is completely off the table. We're on a we're on a one way street. There's no turning back. Um, and my sense is that at some point or another, it's going to give, uh, and that's because Iran and Hezbollah, um, and they're they're all ramping up for some sort of confrontation or escalation. But there's so many possibilities on the table. It can go so many different ways that it's almost impossible to predict. Um, but what I can definitely say is um, Hamas has growing interests in Lebanon. 
uh, and that you might even see Hamas operating out of South Lebanon, which would be incredibly strategic for two reasons. One, it shifts attention away from Gaza, meaning they have no civilian losses. Nothing civilian and nothing of their political or, or home front infrastructure is at stake. Uh, and also Nasrallah from Hezbollah will also be able to spare Lebanon, you know, basically a full week of carpet bombings because Israel will have to respond to Hamas. Um, but you also have Syria. You have all these fronts that are opening up. And Iran, I can't emphasize enough, Iran is is progressing and developing uh both diplomatically and militarily at a rate that could not have been conceived of five years ago. It was completely inconceivable. Just today, they announced that they're going to be having talks with the Egyptians and probably opening up uh, embassies. Saudi Arabia happened a few weeks ago. They signed a, a, a series of tens of agreements with Syria, basically solidifying their place within the uh Syrian, I guess, military apparatus. They run all of the airports. They have complete control of the Israeli border. Um, they have the Iraq-Syrian border. Iran, Iran has basically taken over <laughs> the most important chunks of the Middle East. Very interesting. Um, I could talk about this for hours, but I got a nip. Um, where can people get hold of you and uh, you know follow your work on uh, Israel-Palestine? Um, people can get a hold of me, of course, via email. Ari dot flansreich at gmail.com um, and I've been writing lately for Tablet Magazine Haaretz Magazine which is a left-leaning uh, Israeli publication yeah Tablet they're cool man I, I speak to uh, you speak to Jacob Siegel he... uh huh yeah I just actually I published my first piece with them I think uh, a few days ago they're great they have good quality stuff they're kind of like the Jewish Los Angeles New York <laughs> um, you know what I mean um, so yeah that's about it okay all right, mate. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Thanks for having me. That was Ari Flansreich speaking about the very tense situation between Israel and Palestine. The uh, Palestinian joint operations ruined the prospect of a possible third intifada. Maybe it's even started. Who knows? Definitely check out Ari's work. Uh, he's a good guy. He's doing good work out there. If you like what we're doing and you want to support us, you want to see this keep growing, go to patreon.com slash popular front. There's loads of extras there um, for very little money every single month. It keeps us moving forward. It means we don't have to rely or go to any corporate backed investors or anything weird like that. Currently, we're keeping everything grassroots and that's how we want to keep it. So yeah, patreon.com slash popular front. Check out the shop. We've got all new merch there uh, and an anthology of the zine. So if you missed out on the zines, you can go there and get all of them together in a brand new book type thing. Um, that's www.popularfront.shop. Follow us on social media, Instagram at popular.front. We are completely shadow banned on there, despite having almost half a million followers. So if you can follow us there uh, at popular.front. Uh, Twitter at popularfront underscore. The TikTok is at popular.front. Um, yeah, that's everything. Uh, YouTube, our new documentary, uh, reporting from the ground in France amidst the riots, showing how it's not just about pension reforms. YouTube.com slash popular front. Oh yeah, thank you to our sponsors, Oracle Coffee Shop in Portland, Oregon, USA. They're an independent coffee business selling only fair trade products. You can see them at 3875 Southwest Bond Avenue 97239. If you go in and tell them popular front send you, you will get a discount of some kind. Uh, also, a prop, uh, Propagandopolis, an outlet selling and writing about historical conflict propaganda from around the world. You can buy prints at propagandopolis.com. Use a promo code POPULARFRONT10 for 10% off. Uh, also sponsored by Grind Core House, a pair of independent coffee shops in Philadelphia, USA. One in South, one in West. You can find them on socials at Grind Core House. Very soon, we're going to be... Um, launching a coffee literally popular front coffee beans with them very specific very strong it's going to be called flight risk um coffee uh we're going to be launching that with grind core house literally within a month um so yeah that will be going there check them out they're cool very good people very nice people to work with um 
Music in this episode, the intro was by Home and the outro was by Sam Black. Check his music out at samblackpf.com. There are links to his SoundCloud and Spotify, all of that. Definitely look him up. Uh, very big part of Popular Front. Uh, his Instagram is samblack.jpeg, J-P-E-G. Thank you to the high tier patrons. They are Jake Fuentes, Viola Forvel, Christian Bustamante, Victor Villa, Daniel Verdin, Margosha, Rohan Irvin, Ryan Barbadillo, VS, Brian R, Evan Pank, Bradley Hope, Wizard Actual, Claire Hofbauer, Benjamin Tupper, Chongus Bongwater, Siddhartha O, Cameron Collins, Matthew Diff Diffley, Claire, Liana, Robert, Sean, Christian Orvich, NTHG, Ethan Zwick, Kafir, Peter Nybraten, Gabriel, Gabriel K, Elise Middlefart, David McManus, Tom Petrie, James Leons, Bradley Davies, No Dogs No Amsters, Brendan Crave, B, Dallas Dunn, LD50 Seattle, K Glitter Vulcan, Adam H, Larson 8669, uh, Ivan Julien, Bjorn Kirsten, Diamond Steen, Michael O'Connor, Jack Doherty, Nicholas Butter, JD, Jav, James Cully, Tynan Daly, Ethan, Fitz Madrid, Ed Coulthard, D San, Mike Barone, Liam Williams, DZA, Giorgio Arani, the, the Vegan Straight Edge Global Cabal, Amy R, Rubicon, Frank Austin, Amelia Me, Christina Rivetti, Freya Northman, Niebuhr, Noah, Andrew Hurley, Vida Provost, Brian McLaughlin, Tom Lochrin, Young Wasabi, Tony Bin, JL, Stephen Davila, Dan Dunham, Chad Walker, Lawrence Abrahams, Pete McCormick from What Bitcoin Did, Christopher Martin, Ryan Sandercock, and Moritz Zumbu. Thank you all very much. It's very much appreciated. With the cost of living crisis, a lot of people have messaged me and be like, look, I can't, can't support on Patreon anymore. Totally understand that. Um, unfortunately, it means we've taken a very big hit. So I do very much appreciate uh, all the people still out there able to and continuing to support us on the Patreon. A lot, a lot of new content is coming, um, as I'm sure you will see.